Rebecca here, Hush Puppy here. We are here this today. We are here today. We are here today to do a monthly wrap up. It's August. It's the end of the month. The start of a new month. It's August. We had a good July around here. It was a busy July. My husband Justin and I went up to Providence, Rhode Island for a weekend, which was so nice. And we left Hush Puppy with a college student and he didn't trash our house and have a party. And that was a win. And then we also went on a really long road trip. Part of that time with Hush Puppy, part of that time Hush Puppy stayed with my parents in DC. We drove all over the South, East, we were in Asheville, Atlanta, South Carolina, Richmond. It was great. I did record vlog while that happened, but I haven't edited it. But I will one day and then it'll be on the internet. So that was July. It was busy. We did lots of good summer stuff. Um, July was also the month that my backyard tomatoes came out, my cucumbers, my zooks. I even have a delicata squash. Not to brag, but to brag. Hydrangeas. The garden is popping. It's been a great month. Looking forward to August. Books. We have Dose Libros. 12 books here. The only reason that is at all possible is because several of them are teensy weensies. We had some tinies. I know many of you participated this month in the tiny book challenge, as did I. I read four tinies for that challenge and another tiny just because. I felt like it. Okay, the first book I read this month was Jane by Maggie Nelson. If you're new around here, I love Maggie Nelson. She's amazing. Her next book comes out in September. It's called On Freedom, and it just arrived in the mail from Grey Wolf Press yesterday. So I'm excited to read that. Jane tells the story of her aunt who was raped and murdered. So this is a dark, dark book. In typical Nelson fashion, it does not fit in any way into one genre. There's a mixture of poetry, investigative journalism. I love that she includes excerpts from Jane's journal. At the time of publishing in 2005, the murder was still unsolved. I had to Google. Today, the murder has been solved. I know there's sort of a sequel follow-up to this called The Red Parts, which at this point might be the only Maggie Nelson I've not read. So I'm excited to get to that. This was good. This was everything you expect from Maggie Nelson. Incredibly well-written, smart, clever, dark, cutting. Really enjoyed it. I would also say that if you were expecting like a true crime investigative thriller, you're not gonna get that. Technically, yes, she's discussing an unsolved mystery, but solving the crime, figuring out who did it, is not her main concern. Her main concern is figuring out who Jane was and what it means to her and her family. Loved it. The beautiful, wonderful people at Soft Skull Press sent this to me, even though it's a super backlist, because I said I love Maggie Nelson and I hadn't read this one, and they were too kind. Isn't that amazing? Book people are the best. So nice. I love book people. Next, I read two books about ghosts. Not actually about ghosts, books about grief. First one I read was Ghost Forest by Pig Xuan Fung. This was a net galley arc. And the other one was Seeing Ghosts, which was a physical arc. Here's Ghost Forest. And do, 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 do. here is Seeing Ghosts. I read both of these for a vlog that is up on my channel. They deal thematically with really similar topics. They're both about being a first generation Chinese immigrant to the West, thinking about the physical and emotional divides between them and their families, their parents. And they're both about grieving a parent. I loved reading these books together because they took similar topics they spoke to each other, they illuminated aspects of each other, but they approached these topics in such different styles. I mentioned this in the vlog, but this book, Ghost Forest, keeps you at a distance. It does not allow you to get too close in a way that really mirrors 
the relationship that the narrator feels with her father. I would highly recommend reading this book in a physical arc if you're going to read it. The page breaks seem very important. They're a stylistic choice by the author. I wish I had not read it in Kindle for that reason. This book is the opposite of keeping its distance. It wants you to feel so uncomfortably intimate with the process of diving into loss and memory and dealing with all of those emotions. I am in awe of Kat Chow and the process she put herself through to write this book. I think it takes a very specific strength to to, to make a memoir, especially one so vulnerable as this. But those are my two ghost, grief, spooky books. Then it was time for the tiny challenge. I read four books for the tiny challenge and I did do little mini reviews in my Instagram stories and I saved them to my currently reading highlight if you're curious. The Dry Heart, The Emissary, Welcome to America, and The Lover. Of these two are sort of classics. Ginsberg and Duras are two books that are like foundational texts, texts smart female writers and I can see why I really enjoyed both of them particularly the dry heart highly highly recommend it opens with the main character protagonist shooting her husband in the face and then moves backwards to sort of explain why she has done that by the end I personally was on her side I was on her side to begin with, let's be real. Both of these books are great examples of the power of tinies. Like this book is so tiny. How many pages? Fewer than 100, 87 pages. Ginsburg did not waste a single word. When I finished this book, I was like, I don't know why people read normal sized novels because <laughs> saying this is just like a, a good book, but shorter is a false comparison. I think that keeping it to 88 pages creates a unique challenge to the author that makes every page more meaningful, more impactful. I loved this book so much. The language was so good. I did some highlighting. Words have a way of scaring us when we're young. I still thought I ought to marry and be like everyone else. Then little by little, I learned to make life less of a tragedy. So good. I enjoyed this. This book is an autobiographical fiction by Duras about meeting her lover when she was living in Vietnam. There are definitely some pieces of the colonial privilege aspects of her and her familial's positions that are not explored and uncomfortable to read in 2021 for sure. Ridiculous cover. Now a major motion picture is terrible. It was billed as super erotic and I did not feel that way necessarily. Maybe I'm just a freak. What's erotic to me is not erotic to other people. I thought Cassandra at the Wedding was erotic where she's like getting drunk and breaking shit. That got me hot and bothered. This was like fine. Sorry, mom, if you're watching. I will say our protagonist, who's based on Duras, wears this amazing, well-described outfit on a ferry, gold lame shoes and an oversized silk dress. I love that. And that is now the outfit of my dreams. The woman of my dreams will always be wearing gold lame shoes and a silk dress. The other two tinies I read, I absolutely love The Emissary and Welcome to America. Emissary, Japanese, takes place in the near future post-apocalyptic Japan. Cut off from the rest of society, there's been a disaster. Children are frail and dying. Weird, really good, went very quickly. Confusing ending. Call me if you can explain it to me. Favorite tiny, favorite book of the month. My only five star for the month. I loved this book so much. Welcome to America, written by Lynn Bostrom Kanaskar. You may know her as the wife of Carl Oof Kanaskar. Our protagonist is a young girl. We get a very precocious child perspective. Really, really reminded me of My Brilliant Friend and the Story of a New Name. Like the first couple Ferrantes, that precocious child narrator who has been wronged, knows that they've been given a shitty hand in life, recognizes that injustice, but also is tinged with that self-obsessive way that children think. This book drips with that the same way that the early Neapolitan novels do. Dark, it broke me, it broke my heart. 
thinking about rereading this. Definitely excited to read some more Knausgaard. I think there are three Knausgaards translated to English. The next one I want to read is October Child. Oh, about this book. We have our narrator. She lives with her mother and brother. Her father and mother separated and then soon after her father killed himself. They're all... It's okay, it's just the mail. It's just the mail, sweetheart. It was the mail. They're all still grieving. The three of them are grieving in three different directions, trying to come together at certain points, failing and flying apart from each other and trying to come back together. A great sad kid book. I loved this so, so much. The next book I read was Too Much and Not the Mood. This book was sent to me by Lindsay, who I talk about in literally every video. I, by the way, I just visited her. On that road trip, I went to Atlanta to visit Lindsay, and it was amazing. She has three cats, Paul, Tony, and Cannoli. They're great. Anyway, Lindsay sent this to me. This is a collection of essays. The writing is so good. The writing feels like the way people really talk, not an affectation of writing to sound like the way people talk. Generally, I prefer my writing to sound like writing because writing that tries to sound like talking sounds affected. But this really sounded, felt, read like speaking, like thinking. Not every essay is equally as strong. The first essay takes up a third to a half of the book. It's really long. It is called Heart Museum. It is about being in awe, being awed, the feeling of awe. So beautiful. I loved it. The rest of the book was good. Some essays were fine, but that initial essay, it made me feel like opening up my email and reading the first email that someone you love has ever written to you many years later. That's what reading this book felt like. Okay, blow your house down. This was kindly sent to me by Counterpoint Press. This is a wild memoir by Gina Frangello about the disillusionment of her marriage because of an affair that she's having. There's also a lot of discussion of her body, her womanness struggle with chronic pain and chronic illness. The way that her struggle with pain has to do with the way that the world operates against women. Her involvement in marriage has to do with the way the world operates against women. Her relationship with her lover, her relationship with her parents, her relationship with her children, all viewed through this battle between will and the forces at play against us as women. It asks a lot of questions that it doesn't answer. I like that in a book. I don't want a book to tell me how to think. When you have a divorce narrative memoir, it is tempting to grapple with the question of sides and guilt. And I'm not really interested in that question. I don't care whose fault the end of the marriage is, who's the guilty party, who deserves to have been cheated on, who deserves to have been left, who deserves to be hated. None of those questions are particularly interesting to me. The least successful moments of this book are when it feels that Gina Frangello is defending herself to some imaginary court of justice over this divorce. She's put herself in a really challenging position. I would say this book is challenging. It feels like it was challenging to write. In some ways it's challenging to read. It's also one that has stuck with me. It asks questions that I'm still thinking about. Overall, I actually enjoyed this more than I thought I was going to. Okay, next I read The Divorce. This was another tiny. I had never heard anything about this. Introduction by Patty Smith, that sold me. Cesar Ira has published over a hundred books. That's crazy. An Argentinian author. This is a weird magical realist little guy. I thought it was gonna be about a divorce. It's not. It opens with our character saying, I was in the middle of a divorce, so I flew to Buenos Aires from Providence, Rhode Island to get away for a weekend. And that's the last mention of the divorce. The divorce is obviously the divorce of space and time, separating space from time in a way that we don't necessarily see in reality. Using fiction to, to separate, to divorce space and time constraints. This book takes place in one single moment in which our main character is sitting in a cafe in Buenos Aires. A bike goes by and water falls on it. See water on a bike. And then from that moment, it sort of just splinters off to these memories and these moments that are all tied together in this single moment of the bike. If I'm having trouble explaining it, it's because it's a weird book. But I like a weird book. Under 100 pages, quick, weird, thinking little dude. Wayward by Dana Spiata. All right, 
Oh yeah, yeah. This book was reviewed in the New York Times by Carl Sagal. Love Carl Sagal. She said, nothing happens in this book. There's no plot. And we just are in the mind of a thinky woman. Blurb by Jenny Off on the back. It sounds right up my alley. And this was kindly sent to me by Knopf, who I love. I am sorry, Knopf, because I really appreciate you sending this to me. I wish I could help you sell copies of this book, but I can't because I truly did not like this book. I'm really sorry. Did not like this book. Here's what happened with this book. First, I opened it and started reading it. Immediately, I was like, I don't like the writing in this book. Okay, so I'm not gonna love this book, but maybe I'll like it. Maybe it'll get better, but it got worse. First of all, dialogue. I hate poorly done dialogue. Most of the books that I love have very minimal dialogue at all in it. Usually it's just the recollection of a conversation. Dialogue is hard to do well. Conversations are full of filler words and fluff that we don't need to know as readers. We need to know how people felt and what they thought, and I don't really care as much about what they said. Particularly this book centers around a divorce, which means there's Fighting. Dialogue between two people when they are fighting is the ultimate pet peeve for me. It is terrible and cheesy in this book. So that's my number one complaint. Worse than that, this book just drips with clueless old person white privilege in a way that drives me crazy. And as I started reading it, I was like, Rebecca, maybe you're being an ageist piece of shit, which is totally possible. Maybe this is because I'm not going through menopause and I'm having a failure of empathy here. That is entirely possible. It's possible that some of that is happening, but I mentioned this in the vlog where I read this, but there's this tiny little storyline in which our clueless white protagonist, older woman, witnesses the murder of a black child boy at the hands of police. That is like an incredibly traumatic, triggering event and it is used in no way to discuss justice around this topic. It's just like a ploy in which this woman then thinks more about herself and her own issues. I thought it was like an incredibly cheap gimmick on Spiata's part. I don't know how it made it in this book, how it passed through the editors. This book annoyed me. I did not like it. Am I overreacting? It's possible. Is it bad? It's better than anything I can write. For sure. I really struggle with giving bad negative reviews. It's hard because it is still a book and writing a book is a really impressive thing and I could not do it. And yet, don't read it. Or read it and tell me I'm wrong. Maybe some of you loved it. Did anybody out there read this and love it? Let me know. And if you did, that's cool. There is no such thing as an objectively good or bad book. I think it is entirely possible that somebody could love this book. Somebody who also loves books that I love too was not for me. Last book of the month, the Alexander Chi essays, how to write an autobiographical novel. These were fine. There are two ways you might love this book. One is if you're a super fan of Alexander Chi because he talks a lot about how he wrote his specific novels. If there were another author, a Maggie Nelson book all about her writing process or a Rachel Cusk book all about how she has written her books, I think I would be completely enthralled by that. I would be picturing the books themselves, but because this is my first Chi, I think this is not the place to start. There is an assumed understanding of his body of work that I don't have. Secondly, I think if you're an aspiring writer, for the same or similar reasons, you might love this book. So much insight into the writing process. I'm also not an aspiring writer. I'm just here to read. I like to eat the books. I don't like to cook the books, you know? Just here to consume. Oink oink. So yeah, this book was fine. That was my month in reading. How'd I do? I do have my monthly recommendations. My recommendations. First of all, this month I did discover the world's best chocolate chip cookie recipe. And this is not like my first time around the block with chocolate chip cookies. Yes, I've made the Allison Roman shortbread. They're good. Yes, I've made the New York Times best chocolate chip cookie. It's good. But this is the most success I've ever had with a chocolate chip cookie. And let me tell you about it. Joy the Baker's Dad's Brown butter recipe. So first, you brown a ton of butter. And she's got a video all about how to do that so you don't mess it up, don't burn it. Great. You brown the butter you put in the fridge. A couple hours later, you make the dough. This is very similar to a traditional chocolate chip cookie recipe. Nothing earth shattering here. Then you put the dough in the fridge and you let it sit there for like 24 hours. And when you bake your cookies, you just have like movie cookies. Pillowy, mounds the platonic ideal of a chocolate chip cookie. Also, flaky sea salt on the top, 
and flaky sea salt on the cookie sheet so that when you bite into it, the salt hits your tongue first because it's on the bottom of the cookie, very important. I'm giving out all my cookie secrets here today. I love you guys and I want you to be happy and, and have the world's best chocolate chip cookies. Second recommendation was a really interesting article about this pattern of literary adaptation adaptations for television linked to downstairs. We've been noticing some of our favorite literary fiction such as Neapolitan novels, such as The Sally Rooney, such as Underground Railroad, being turned into TV miniseries. Furthermore, because of this pattern, we're seeing that not only is literature affecting TV, but TV is now affecting literature, the way that people are writing, whether consciously or subconsciously, with an eye towards adaptation. I don't know if anyone else feels this way, but it does feel like a lot of the it books that are coming out recently seem primed and perfect for a TV adaptation. And I think that this could be because there's this subconscious effect or conscious effect on our authors and they're thinking about it as they're writing it. But I think it's also that the gatekeepers, the publishers who are choosing which books get publicity, which books get made, are often choosing books with an eye towards who they're gonna be able to sell the TV rights to. This is another interesting hitch in the consumerism of literature that I think is worth, worth thinking about and thinking about what effect that's gonna have on us as readers. Lastly, there was an article in Harper's Bazaar about this reinvigoration of Y2K fashion and low-rise jeans and all of that is coming back with the youths, the youths of today. Don't know if you know that, guys, but the youths are into what we all wore when we were teenagers. They wish they had limited to, you know what I'm saying? They wish they had access to my limited to Aeropostale wardrobe. This article makes an interesting comment about how the clothes were tailored, designed for a specific body type that uh, did not exist naturally, created a sense of body dysmorphia in this generation as they were coming up. This question of how has our understanding of body positivity adapted in the time frame and what does that mean? to bring back clothes that highlighted certain factors of women's bodies that we are no longer cumulatively, culturally as obsessed with. And mostly I'm recommending this article because it is an excuse to share with you my favorite collection of TikToks of all time. I'm gonna pull it up. Carly Aquilino. I'm gonna be honest, I don't know who that is, but I Googled it and she's a comedian I'd never heard of. Her TikTok is Fashion Girl for 2069. Love it. I absolutely love that Y2K style is coming back, but there is some cherry picking going on and I think that we need to have an open discussion about it because when I think about Y2K, I don't think crop tops and halter tops and low rise jeans only. I think about... I think about how we really wore every accessory at the same time. I think about how we wore jeans underneath skirts and dresses. We walked out the house like this. We said, I'm going out with my friends. You need to watch these TikToks. They're just so good. Link downstairs. Please go watch them. Especially if you were a teenager in the early 2000s and had like an insanely large belt. If you owned anything that said Von Dutch on it, you have to watch this. That's a rule. I don't make the rules. All right, those are my recommendations for July. I hope you get a chuckle out of that last one. Thanks for being here. Please, please, please comment below. Tell me what your favorite read of July was. What was the best book you read in the month of July? I have the most insane TBR pile of my entire life right now. I acquired many books in both Rhode Island and Atlanta over the month of July. Came home to some book mail so much to read so i've got to go on a little book buying band at the moment so i can catch up on the good stuff i'm currently reading everyone knows your mother is a witch by rivka galshin so i'll be talking about that sometime soon and that's it from me happy august enjoy these last grasps of the sweet sweet summer and i'll be back soon love you nerds